Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Easy Continuous Deployment You Can Trust with uh, Brian Kenzior from Solana Labs and Neil Mandvar from SOS. In today's session, Brian and Neil will show you how to build a continuous deployment release pipeline using Solano CI, SOS Labs, and AWS. My name is Bill McGee and I'll be moderating today's session. You can contact me in the chat panel or Q&A box if you're having any technical issues or questions. The Q&A panel is also the best place to submit questions you have for Brian and Neil as they go through their presentation. We'll get to as many questions as we can in the last 10 to 15 minutes of this hour. Uh, one note, we are recording this session today. Once it's ready, you'll receive an email with the links to the recording and to the slides. So without any further ado, let's get started and I'll be passing it on to you, Brian. Thanks for the introduction. Um, quickly, let's just go through the agenda of what we're going to accomplish today. So, first, we're going to talk through a case study of a SOC Labs and Solana CI joint customer and their journey to continuous deployment. And then we're going to go through a demo and actually show you the steps that you need to take to build a continuous deployment pipeline using SOC Labs and Solana CI. Then we're going to kind of give a retrospective on continuous deployment, why you should be paying attention to continuous deployment, why it matters to you, and a lot of the benefits that you'll receive from using something like continuous deployment. And then we'll um, have about 15 minutes at the end for questions and um, a few extra slides about Solana CI and SOS Labs. So to jump in, um, the joint customer that we're going to be talking about is a consumer goods company, e-commerce retailer, and what they really need is to achieve full continuous deployment for multiple reasons. Um, first, they need speed. They need to increase the speed at which new features and bugs reach their customers. If a bug comes up on an e-commerce site, you need to know that the fix is verified and you need to get that fix up as soon as possible. Um, it needs to be clean. They need to be able to deploy all of their code into a fleet of AWS instances that they already have. Um, and that deployment needs to be quick and it needs to be traceable. They need to be able to roll it back. They need to be able to um, see every step of the way when the deploy is running and how it's running. And they also need it to be clear. Um, they need to be able to utilize a single UI to track the deployments and debug errors as the deployment goes on. A lot of tools allow you to string together multiple different tools, but there's no single UI where you can track and have a release manager actually see every step of, step of the way, see passes and failures. Um, and some of the needs that they need, um, push button deployment is something that a lot of people are talking about. You need to be able to push a button and that needs to start off your deployment pipeline and deploy a fresh new build to production. Um, you need confidence, obviously, if you're going to be automating deployments to your production. Um, you need to know that every single verification step is robust, that it's going to run, and that the code being tested is the right code. Um, so you need to be able to be confident in your deployment pipeline above all else. And then obviously you need reliable partners that work well together. You're going to be doing your testing using one partner, potentially doing browser testing with another partner, load testing with something else. Um, so you need to be able to string together all the tools that you already use to into a giant pipeline that you can trust. Um, the other thing that's important in the continuous deployment pipeline is being able to test for all of your different users, right? So um, for an e-commerce company, you need to be able to serve a grandmother in the Midwest using the, a really old version of Internet Explorer. You also need to be able to serve, you know, someone in tech in San Francisco who has the latest Chrome browser. And so being able to do CI on unit testing, but also do browser testing across all the different browsers is extremely important for this particular company. And so the solution, um, AWS Code Pipeline, is a tool that allows you to string together multiple different steps into a seamless, um, fully integrated deployment pipeline. And for this particular solution, we're going to be using GitHub, Solana Labs to do unit testing, Soft Labs to do functional testing, as well as AWS Code Deploy to do the actual deployment. And what a lot of people have been asking for is a single push button deployment. And here is a pre-baked pipeline. Um, we'll walk through all the steps on how we built this and how it works. But right here, you click one button, release change, release, and the pipeline is started. So the code that is in GitHub is now going to run through the pipeline, do all the verification steps, and at the end here, AWS Code Deploy is going to deploy it and it's going to be in, in production. It's as simple as clicking a button. 
So let's actually go through and figure out and show you guys how AWS Code Pipeline and how all of this is set up and how all the different tools work. Um, Code Pipeline is a rather robust tool that allows you to string together multiple different steps. And so if you actually go here, I've got a pre-built pipeline that has all the different steps. So first, your source step. Um, this is where your code is hosted. Code Pipeline allows you to use GitHub as well as um, AWS S3 buckets. So if you want to put your code and deploy it into an S3 bucket and have that kick off your pipeline, you can do it that way. Um, with GitHub, you can have your pipeline trigger every single time a build or a new commit is pushed to that um, branch. So in this case, we're having our master branch tracked by GitHub, and any time a PR is merged into master, or someone does a manual change on master, the pipeline fires. And this may sound kind of scary, but as long as you put a, a reasonable check on um, your master branch, you have one person that has the ability to push to master, um, it's a really reasonable way to kick off a deployment. And for this example, we're actually going to be using a sample application. Um, we have a link to the sample application that will come up at the end of the presentation. But essentially, this sample application is a Ruby gem. We're going to be running Ruby tests and using Selenium with Sauce Connect to run the browser tests. Um, I want to highlight the fact that it doesn't need to be Ruby. You could use Java, you could use JavaScript. But just for this example and the ease of the demo, we're going to be using Ruby. And this simple application is really just um, a static website, and the static website is index.html file. It's got some basic CSS and a few different classes, but the main thing that we're going to be doing is running unit tests on the Ruby gem and then uploading that Ruby gem to S3. Once we upload that Ruby gem to S3, we're going to replace this placeholder text right here with the link to the Ruby gem. And then we're going to move on to our next step, at which point Sauce is going to test and we've got Selenium tests that make sure that this placeholder text has been changed with that S3 link. And then we're going to deploy the page so people can click on the link and download the new gem that we've just built. Moving on to the next step, we have the Solano CI step, which will be doing our unit testing. And here is a run that's gone through already. Um, this is the Solano CI report page. And as you can see, we have 16 passes, one skipped build. And first thing you see is all the tests that run. These are all unit tests. And they're all split up nicely so that you can see exactly what passed, what failed. If you have a failure, you can really quickly jump to the failing test and open it up figure out how to debug and fix that problem. Um, and the way that Solano CI uses configuration and allows you to change how your build is interpreted is using a YAML file. And so this YAML file is source controlled. It lives in your repository. And if you go to that GitHub link at the end, you can actually see the example configuration file. But for this um, example, we're using a pretty simple configuration file. We're setting the Ruby version. We're setting the bundler version. And then we're setting a test pattern and an exclude pattern. So the test pattern is telling us to run everything in the spec folder that ends with underscore spec.rb. And the exclude pattern is saying exclude all of our functional tests because we're going to be running those on Sauce Labs later. And then I've got some hooks, which are the post build hooks. So as soon as the build passes and everything is successful, I'm going to run this script called build and upload gem. Build and upload gem will upload that gem to S3 and replace the placeholder text that I showed you guys a little bit earlier. And so because this test passed, um, code pipeline continued. We ran the build and upload gem um, command. And so now we can jump back and go to the next step. And so the next step is another Solano CI step. But this Solano CI step is actually kicking off some Sauce Labs tests with Sauce Connect. And before we jump back to Sauce, let's actually look at the configuration file that we use to achieve this. So first thing we do is actually a few pre-setup tools. Um, what we're going to do is download the Sauce Connect binary, um, open it up, and then worker setup is actually um, happening 
once per each worker. And so Solana Labs is highly parallelized and it's automatically parallelized. So as you can see right here, we're running this build with two workers, which means two VMs started up. And so for each worker, what we're going to do is start a web server. And that web server is what Soft Labs is going to use to basically serve up the content um, and do the browser testing. And then we're also going to start Sauce Connect, which is the Sauce Tunnel from Solano to Sauce Labs, so that they have access to that um, that web server. And then right here, as in the last one, we actually have a test exclude pattern, which is excluding the tests that we run in the last step. And then here, we're actually running the tests themselves. And so what you can see here is we're setting the platform, the browser name, the version of the browser, the JUnit directory and then we're running the same spec. And what this allows us to do is test the same test on multiple different browsers using Sauce Connect. And so here we're testing on Windows 8.1, on Windows 7, on Windows XP, on OS X, and we're testing across Chrome and Firefox and multiple different versions of them. And so to summarize what we're doing here is we're using a uh, Ruby RSpec framework to test on various configurations that the users are using, such as Windows 8.1 and all the other ones that Brian mentioned. And we're going to run against that index.html that we're going to deploy against, which the test, what it's going to be doing exactly, is verifying that that placeholder text is no longer there and it gets uh, replaced with some valid link, valid text. Yeah, and so this is the Sauce Labs dashboard for this particular build, and as you can see, um, Sauce Connect was connected, which means that we can access that web server that's running, and then there's icons to tell you which OS you're running on, which browser you're running on. You can also go ahead and click on the text called should have a link in the caption, and this test is doing exactly what it sounds like. It's testing to make sure that there's a link in the caption, and it's not just that placeholder text. And so you actually get a nice little run through. The test ran relatively quickly, so there's not much to show, but it actually shows you connecting to um, localhost 8000, which is where I was hosting the, um, the web server. And to Brian's point, uh, where you see localhost 8000, this was uh, hosted on the Solano CI slave that was the execution was happening on. So basically, we spun up a simple Python, a simple HTTP server uh, on the build slave that the test execution was actually happening on as well. And then uh, using Sauce Connect, the Sauce browsers are able to come back and connect to localhost 8000 and get and receive the application under test and move on with the test. Yeah. And on the left, we see uh, we saw the Selenium commands, and you can see the screenshots at that point in time. So yeah, just click through one of them, and you can see uh, what the product looked like at that point in time, as well as you have a screencast or a video on a, where, where you see the watch tab right next to commands on the top and you can watch the video from start to finish. And as Brian mentioned, this was a very quick test, so it'll probably just take seconds to go through it. But what happened is we spun up a brand new pristine Windows 7 um, a VM and bootstrapped it with the Firefox browser and uh, ran your test on it. After the test, we destroyed the VMs and uh, so that nothing is left over. So, that, so you have confidence that uh, every time that you run a test, it spins up a brand new pristine environment and then Runs and then uh, runs a test on it. Hey Neil, a question came in. Uh, maybe you could uh, take uh, two seconds and explain what Soft Connect is, real quick. Yeah. So Soft Connect is uh, the tunneling solution that allows the Sauce Lab browsers to have access to your application under test, uh, under if it's behind the firewall or hosted locally. So just to clarify, uh, if you're running a test without Sauce Connect and you're trying to test something behind the firewall or localhost, that's not going to be quite possible. And Sauce Labs needs access to get uh, into your uh, server or get through your firewall or into your localhost, and that's done by using Sauce Connect, which establishes a TLS tunnel in which Sauce Labs browsers can communicate with the application under test or any servers that it needs access to. Cool. And as you can see, there's actually one concurrent VM being used. So that example that I fired off at the beginning of the, the, the talk is actually starting to run some of those sauce tests. Um, 
Yeah, and so if we jump back to the, the Solano um, side, we had a quick question about where the configuration file lives, and that's a great question. Um, I can actually go back to the sample application and show you the Solano.yaml right here. So this lives in your, your source control repository, and it's um, obviously it's source controlled, so if you ever want to make a change or you need to figure out why something broke, um, you have the history of that entire file. The other thing that we find is really awesome about keeping this in source control means that end developers can actually change their testing environment as they need. You don't need to knock on the door of the DevOps guy to get a new package installed. Um, you can just literally change the Ruby version right here for your branch and you can test on a brand new Ruby version. So that's a good question. And as you can, so we're going to go back to Solano CI, and um, this is, so after we went to Sauce Connect, we did all of our browser testing. Sauce Connect came back and actually sent the, the passing status to Solano, and you can actually see the, the session ID that got ran, the job name, get the actual pass failure results in Solano, and once all of them pass, what we're actually going to do is publish back to code pipeline and move on in the pipeline. So right now what we've verified is our code change unit tests work. Um, we've verified that different browsers and all the different browsers that we want to test before we push to production have passed. And so now what we're going to do is actually go and deploy the code. So if we jump back to the pipeline, we're going to move on to the last step, which is AWS code deploy. And AWS Code Deploy is a tool that allows you to use a, another YAML file to control exactly how your application gets deployed. Um, for this case, we're using an Apache server, um, pretty simple, just move files into the www directory, start Apache, and your deployment's complete. Um, but the Code Deploy configuration allows for a lot of flexibility. So why don't I actually go and show you, it's called appspec.yaml. And it's basically a long list of hooks. And so right now, all I'm using is the application start and the application stop hook. But there's multiple hooks along the way before your build gets stopped, before your, your build gets downloaded, and you can customize exactly how your deployment happens. But in this case, all I'm doing is when application stop gets called before the deployment happens. So what I'm going to do is run this script called say goodbye, and I'll show that to you guys in a bit, but all say goodbye does is stop Apache. And then application start actually starts up the application, so it'll just start Apache. Um, the files bit right here essentially tells me where to copy files. So right now I'm taking www files from this repository and I'm putting them in var www html. And say hello and say goodbye are actually scripts that are hosted on my um, repository. And goodbye literally just does an Apache stop, hello, Apache start. And if we actually go into code deploy, we can show you guys a little bit about what the interface looks like. So for code deploy, what you need to do is actually create an application. And an application is multiple different things, but at the, the core of it, it is a list of uh, virtual machines in Amazon that you're going to be deploying to. And so I've made one called Demo Fleet, and it looks like it deployed 11 seconds ago, which is probably the pipeline that I triggered a few minutes ago. And this Demo Fleet is um, just a group of three small AWS instances. And so as you can see, we have revision history right here, which is every single deployment that has happened on this demo fleet. And as you can see, I ran some a minute ago, and there were a few hours ago. So one nice thing about this um, revision history is that I can actually go back and redeploy an old revision. So if for some reason you had a problem in production, or maybe you changed the color and you don't want that color, changed anymore, you can literally click this button and it will redeploy all of that old code. It's really helpful for being able to do rollbacks um, and all of the history is right here. So if you need to figure out when a deployment happened, it's, it's pretty simple to figure out. Um, and let's actually go back to the pipeline to see the details of this specific deployment. 
And so this is the deployment page and it shows me multiple different things, but the most important thing is that it's deploying to this demo fleet and it has this configuration called minimum healthy hosts. Minimum healthy hosts allows you to choose exactly how your um, deployment is going to be considered successful or not. In this example, I'm using three instances, so it's not really that important that um, two out of three are healthy, but in a lot of cases, you're going to be deploying to potentially hundreds of instances, right? So you need to say 75% of my hosts, as long as that 75% is um, successful, I can go in and figure out why the rest of them were broken. Um, a lot of people should probably just put three out of three instances or 100% minimum health um, requirements before it's marked as successful. And then the other bit is the deployment config. So code deploy allows multiple different ways of deploying. Right now it's set to one at a time, which means I'm going to try deploying to one instance. If that fails or succeeds, I'm going to check the minimum healthy host requirement. So say one succeeds, that means I'm still meeting the minimum healthy hosts. So I'm going to move on and try deploying to another one. And you're going to move through all of your instances one at a time. And then there's multiple scales from one at a time to all at once. You can try deploying all of your code all at once. If there are problems, I guess um, you'll deal with it later, but all at once is usually really helpful for um, people that are deploying to staging servers. So maybe you have a pipeline off of a staging branch that deploys to staging servers for your developers to see what it looks like. Um, so all at once is more, more important there. Um, and what we can actually do is look at each individual instance and see all of those different hooks that ran. And so in our example, we were using an application start and an application stop hook, but you also have access to download bundle before install, install. We actually see how long each of the steps took, the status, and you can attach logs to each of the steps if it's important to you. So you have a lot of control over figuring out exactly where in the deployment process your build may or may not have succeeded. So what we're going to go ahead and do is jump back to that pipeline that I started earlier. And as you can see, I clicked the button about 17 minutes ago. It pulled code from GitHub. It ran unit tests on Solano CI. It passed that success onto another Solano CI step, which spun up Sauce Labs tests using Sauce Connect. And once those passed, it went to AWS Code Deploy and deployed to the three instances that I showed you guys, one at a time. And it succeeded because all three instances were successfully deployed to. If I actually go ahead and click into this instance, and pull up the IP, I can actually show you the successful deployment. And so what you saw right here, this is the link that used to be underscore placeholder underscore. It's now replaced with a link to that gem that we built. And it's been fully tested, so I was very confident pulling up this page and showing it to you guys because we've done browser testing already. I knew it was going to work. Um, and yeah, so that is full full pipeline. Brian, real quick, do you mind showing uh, just inspecting the element, showing the placeholder and the text and the test itself, so that we can show that how we have uh, how we have confidence that this is quality code and can be deployed? Yeah, absolutely. And so I pulled up the inspector here, and I believe I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that you guys can see this better. Um, this uh, anchor tag has an href with um, the gem that I just deployed, and actually click on this and to, um, download the gem. But what we can also do is go to the sauce test, or the functional test that we wrote in GitHub. And zoom this in for you. We have a test called, it should have a link in the caption. And what this is telling the browser to do is look at localhost 8000, and then find the element with the class caption, and save the attribute href to the link variable. And we're expecting the link not to include placeholder. 
And so if you guys remember, and I will go back to the actual code that is in GitHub, the link text is placeholder. And so in order for that sauce test to pass, we would have had to run the unit tests on Solano and specifically run the script, the post deploy script that I mentioned, which deploys the gem and changes this placeholder text. And I can show you guys, pull up that script. So build and upload gem, it uploads some things to S3, but then it also runs sed and re literally replaces the placeholder with the location that I got after uploading to S3. So, and this runs in Solano CI after the unit test passed. Um, do we have any other questions? Yes, uh, two questions about um, code pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, is soft connect port forwarding and is application start hook used by AWS code deploy directly? Yeah, so just to start on the, um, the AWS code deploy question, application start and all of those hooks are actually run by code deploy. So none of that happens in the pipeline. It's all happening in code deploy. And if you actually go back and view events, you can see all the different events that got run. And application start is running by code deploy on the machine that you're deploying to. I guess that's probably the, the bit that may not have been um, completely clear. All of these steps are being run on the instance that you are deploying to. And then for the bit about soft Soft Connect um, or Soft Connect port forwarding, uh, Neil, I believe you can speak to this more. Yeah, so as long as you have port 80 open and you can communicate to Sauce Labs, uh, you can uh, establish a, and so you, all you need is port 80 and port 443, and then you launch Sauce Connect and they'll create a, H, a TLS tunnel in which everything will be encrypted and go through the tunnel. and. Each request will have a unique key since it's using the TSL spec. And yeah, so there's no additional ports that will be needed to uh, be open for Sauce Connect. You can just go ahead and as long as you can hit Sauce Labs, you should be good to go. And uh, yep. Yeah, and the main thing is that it's extremely secure, right? A lot of people don't want to be shipping their code to random places. And the nice thing here is you don't need to move any code. You're just sending a port over and it's completely secure, so. Yeah, and in addition to that, uh, you can also limit access to what Sauce Labs has ac uh, can access in that uh, you can use a pack file uh, to specify that these domains are allowed to be accessed within. So for example, if you don't want anyone to access your internal GitHub, you can uh, blacklist that as part of the pack file. In addition, you can specify other parameters such as a proxy, so you can, uh, you can enforce those proxy rules as part of uh, uh, using Sauce Connect. Yeah, so what we're going to go ahead and do next is actually set up a pipeline and I can show you how quick and easy it is to create a brand new pipeline. So we're going to use this pre-existing sample application. Um, the only pre-baking that I did here is having the tests, obviously, having the two different YAML files for controlling the different steps in Solano CI, and then also having this appspec.yaml to control the deployment in AWS Code Deploy. So what we're going to go ahead and do here is create a new pipeline. Um, you have to give your pipeline a name, and then you have to choose a source provider. Right now, um, AWS Code Pipeline supports either pulling your source from a specific AWS S3 bucket or from GitHub. For this example, we'll go ahead and use GitHub. So we connect with GitHub, and I'm going to load this sample application, building off of the master branch. And so now, any time that master builds, it will start a pipeline run. I'm going to choose a build provider. Right here, you get to choose your CI provider. And because I'm logged into my demo account, you actually have access to a few additional ones. But really, your only choices here are Solano CI or starting up your own Jenkins cluster and getting that connected, starting all your own Jenkins slaves. So here, I'm going to go ahead and connect to Solano CI. Go through a quick Solano connection. I get to choose which organization I want to build my demo under. And literally like that, 
I'm set up with Solano CI. Um, now I get to choose the deployment provider. For this demo, we were using AWS Code Deploy. If you use Elastic Beanstalk already, you do have that option. And for Code Deploy, um, I had a demo application demo group. So this was um, the three instances are part of that de demo fleet, and demo application is just a way for you to basically put a blanket over which application is being deployed. So in this case, I could have one application for my website and multiple different deployment groups for potentially my staging servers, my production servers, and that. Um, you also need to have an AWS service role that gives code pipeline access to all the different things it needs access to. Um, in the case of this pipeline, really all it needs access to is S3 buckets. Um, and the way that the pipeline actually works is in between each step, you're actually uploading to a new S3 bucket and the step below your step is consuming what you uploaded. So what I'm gonna do right away is actually disable the first um, transition here, just so that the pipeline doesn't run before I'm done. Um, so here, what we'll achieve is pulling from GitHub, running unit tests on Solano, and then deploying to code deploy. But what we wanna do is add in a sauce step here. So what I'm gonna do is go and edit the pipeline and add a new stage. So I'm gonna call my new stage sauce and add another Solano CI action. I believe this can have stages. And just like before, connect it to Solano using one click. And then you get to choose where your input and output artifacts are coming from. And so what I'm going to do is have the input artifact be what the output artifact of the build step was. So that was my app build. And now I need to make a new output artifact. So I'm gonna call this output artifact sauce. And then the last bit that I need to do is actually make the code deploy step, pull in the input artifact that sauce dropped out. So I'm gonna change the input artifacts to sauce, update it, and that's literally all I need to do. Now I can save the pipeline changes, enable that transition, and let the pipeline run. And within four minutes, I've just set up a completely um, full-featured deployment pipeline. The other nice thing about Code Deploy is, as you can see, there's lots and lots of options. So you can add in parallel testing steps. You can do multiple deployments. It's really, really um, full function. So if you want to, if you want to do something with a pipeline, chances are you can achieve it with Code Pipeline. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is save my pipeline changes. So in this case, um, the question was, is there a sauce output artifact? Um, is there a build? Right now, when we're running sauce through Solano CI, the output artifact is basically unchanged from the input artifact. But if you want to change the output artifact, say you want to compile a jar or um, bundle up things into a zip file so that in code deploy you can go ahead and unzip and move a bunch of things. Um, you would do that in Solano CI using your Solano.yaml in the post build hook. So in the post build you can do basically whatever you want and code pipeline will upload everything that is in your source repository at the end of that step. For example, uh, if you wanted to archive uh, or artifact the JUnit reports as well as maybe anything from Sauce, such as the videos and the Selenium logs, you could access that using the REST API and uh, leverage that in uh, your Solano post build and have that archived and artifacted it's as part of your Solano build and just link that from AWS. So as part of your Solano build, you can pull in any assets that you need or any artifacts and archive those. Mm -hmm. And the, the folder that you're running all of your tests in is the exact same folder that gets bundled up and sent to the next step. So as long as your source folder has changed somehow, then you get to, um, you get to upload that to the next step. And the nice thing about that is we could have you just upload a single file, but um, the idea of code deploy or code pipeline rather, is that you're passing along your code to all of the different steps so that, say, 
somewhere down the line you want to add another verification step that requires you to have your code, um, you essentially always have it because of the way that code pipeline works. So for example, if you wanted to do some additional testing, such as load testing or performance testing or anything like that, you would just add in a new step and uh, just read in the artifact as a parameter. And uh, if the test succeeds, you'd output that artifact and move on later with the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the integration with Solano is the way that the pipeline knows if the step, step succeeded. So in Solano's case, as long as the tests and the build in Solano has passed, we will pass along the success or failure. Um, you also have the option of defining your own steps in pipelines. So you can use Lambda functions to define your own steps. Say you have, I don't know, maybe you put a big red button in your, in your office and somehow have that hosted on, um, have that hosted on the internet somewhere and you want one of your steps to be have someone push the big red button. You could add that as a Lambda function, and as long as you implement the pushing the button mark, marks the step as green, um, that's essentially all you need to do. The integration with Code Pipeline is, is rather simple. Cool. So now that you guys have seen the pipeline run and seen the successful um, creation of a pipeline in very, very quick and easy steps, Let's actually go back a little bit and talk about why continuous deployment. What is continuous deployment? Um, some of you have actually maybe heard of continuous uh, delivery and maybe not completely sure is continuous deployment different? Why is it different? Um, and the basic explanation is continuous delivery is making sure that every single code change that you push to your source control is a deployable bundle, right? So it's tested, it's ready to deploy, but that last piece of automatically deploying that bundle is where continuous deployment comes in. And so most organizations that are doing continuous delivery right now um, may need a few extra steps, they may not have full, um, full trust in their testing infrastructure to make that final step into continu continuous deployment. But here I'll argue that continuous deployment is actually a lot faster, it's a lot more safe, and it's actually a lot more clear for your developers. Um, and you should actually look into figuring out a way to make a pipeline so that you can achieve continuous deployment. So why, why continuous deployment? So agility is one of the biggest factors. Um, Ten years ago when we were running CI builds, we were running on waterfall, six-month-long um, deployment targets. Now we're running on two-week sprints. We need to be able to deploy at least once every two weeks, probably even more often than every two weeks. And so that has put a lot of additional bandwidth on right now what is a deployment engineer, right? You have to have a person sitting there managing a deployment, and that person is now extremely overworked. They're, you know, things are running into, running into problems. There are human errors that sometimes pop into the process. If you want to be running an agile software development shop, you need to be able to deploy extremely fast and you need it to be all automated. Um, and then I kind of talked to the safety aspect a little bit earlier, but you need to remove human error from the equation. You may have a 10 step deployment checklist, but if that checklist is being checked by a human, if that human wants to leave work on a Friday afternoon to go hang out with his friends, um, you know, sometimes things get deployed that don't fully follow that checklist. And so having a fully automated continuous deployment pipeline means that every single step in the way is going to be checked. It's going to be checked by a machine and you're going to know for certain whether or not it's safe or not safe to deploy. And then also clarity. Um, a lot of people, especially brand new developers to an organization, don't understand how to push to production. And it probably takes six to eight months before they finally interact with that process and have to file an email to the deployment engineer to get a deployment schedule. Maybe there's too many deployments happening that day, so it needs to get pushed back. Um, right now, there isn't that much clarity around the deployment process. And so if you have a continuous deployment pipeline that every single time that you make a merge to master, a deployment happens, it's super, super easy for developers to understand. It's super easy for, um, for product owners to understand, right? If 
if the product owner knows that this is going to be merged to master and it's going to automatically deploy, they get an email once that automatic deployment happens. Maybe they give an email when the build breaks. At least then they see the automated process, they see exactly where it failed, and they can understand why the process may not have put out the new feature that they wanted. And obviously continuous deployment is scary. A lot of people don't want to put their production site in the hands of an automated process. Um, and so I think that is, that is the challenge, right? The key to implementing a good continuous deployment pipeline is actually having enough automation, enough testing, and a really, really rigid process to make sure that your release is stable. And so you can't just snap your fingers and achieve continuous deployment. First, you need to make sure that you have plenty of test coverage. You need to make sure that you're doing enough browser testing. Um, and all of the steps that used to be human and used to require human act interaction should have a direct um, counterpart that is automated. Um, and so parts, obviously you need continuous integration. You need to make sure that your tests are passing. You need browser testing and you definitely need to have an automated deployment uh, platform. It's no good for you to continuously integrate, to do your browser testing, to potentially do load testing, do all sorts of testing only to generate a zip file that needs to be dragged to every single server by your deployment engineer. That final step needs to be, um, needs to be automated and code deploy does that extremely well. And so bringing it all together, obviously you need all of these steps. So to get a successful continuous deployment pipeline, what you need is something that enables all of these different steps to interact and they need to interact in a very, very simple and easy interface. Um, AWS Code Pipeline allows you to use multiple different steps, multiple different softwares, multiple different partners, and it also allows you to define your own steps using Lambda functions. And so it's nice because it is more or less platform independent. As long as there's integration with code pipeline, you can run all of your steps in one pipeline. And to add on to what Brian said, really having uh, all the automated process in place is really what makes you successful with this. If you're testing in all the different browsers that your users uh, uh, currently use the product in, and you have the proper test coverage such that if some, if a developer was to make a change that's going to cause a regression, uh, that should be caught as part of the automation that gets executed in all the different browsers. Uh, so the only thing that can naturally kind of halt a continuous deployment pipeline is automated tests. So writing tests for any new feature or any bug fix that's going through the pipeline is critical because if something goes wrong with the source code that you've written, the test should be able to catch that, halt the pipeline, get the feedback to the developer, and you should edit that pull request or edit that code change such that uh, everything is in line and working and the test also reflects that and you can promote the code through the pipeline. Yeah. Um, and we had a few questions um, come in during the registration process, one being um, how do you use this with, you know, maybe non-web properties? Um, our our uh, case study was talking about an e-commerce site, but this can honestly be used anywhere software happens, right? Software always needs to get deployed. So if you're doing Internet of Things, if you're doing autonomous vehicles, um, if you're doing anything hardware related, software at some point needs to get deployed to something and that process and that deployment should be automated as well as the testing that gates that deployment. Um, and there were also questions about post-deployment validation tests. So as you saw in the pipeline example, um, we had four steps and the last step was the actual deployment using AWS Code Deploy. With Code Pipeline, you can actually string together tests in any order that you want, and your deployment could have happened first, but you can also add stages after code deploy. So if you want to do load testing and you want to go ahead and add something like blaze meter, run scope, um, you can go ahead and actually add those tests after the fact. And code deploy actually supports rollbacks in a pretty nice way, so as I showed you, earlier with the, um, the different deployments listed and the button to do rollbacks, you can 
retroactively go ahead and do a rollback if um, the deployment wasn't successful or the load tests didn't pass. Um, so you can go ahead and automate it, do an automated uh, rollback. Um, so can the deploy go to Heroku or just AWS directly? Right now, um, the only deployment targets that are supported are AWS Code Deploy and um, I believe Elastic, Elastic Beanstalk. Um, but the option to deploy to Heroku would actually be really, really easy to implement using a Lambda function. If I added a Lambda function, all that Lambda function did was, you know, authenticate with Heroku and do a git push Heroku, that would be a deployment to Heroku and it would be really easy to implement. And they're announcing new integrations built in to Code Pipeline every day. So um, I would subscribe to their, uh, to their email list because there's new stuff coming out all the time. All right, so if there isn't anything else, we're gonna go ahead and jump to our last slide. Um, here we've got some links available. So the first link is the sample application that we use. It has all the different YAML files that were used in this demo. Um, and then a link to the Solana Labs docs explaining how to set up Code Pipeline and how the integration works. Um, also a link to the Sauce Labs wiki, which will give you instructions on how to use Sauce Connect and how to use Sauce Labs browser testing, as well as a link to Code Pipeline, um, just a little bit more information about the product and exactly how it works. Um, so I believe if anyone has questions, now is the time. I'm happy to answer them in the last 10 minutes. All right, <clears throat> well I think that's a wrap. Uh, thank you, Brian, thank you, Neil. Uh, actually, this uh, production took a, a village. Uh, thank you, uh, Leo and uh, Ken. Um, we will be posting, as we said at the outset, the recording of the slides uh, on the Sauce Labs and Solana blogs uh, uh, in a day or so. And if uh, you have any questions, contact information is provided on the uh, last slide. Thanks again. Uh, actually, one last question. Is anyone up in Seattle on the call? Not today. <laughs> today. Uh, very good. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Make it a great week.